Good morning, Dog Nation. I am Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans presented today by Kroger. We are so happy to have you with us here today. A little bit different kind of show in one respect. So last night we were live on video reacting to Joseph Jonah Ajanye's commitment to Georgia. This is a very big deal. As you would imagine, we're going to talk plenty about that on the show today. Now, also what you've come to expect on our program is, is to hear from Jeff Sintel on a Friday. Jeff is actually, even though he was on with us for video last night, Jeff's actually out of town right now, and I'm trying to respect that time for him. So here's what we're going to do. In place of Jeff being here, I'm going to play you some of the audio from what Jeff said last night about Jonah Ajanye and some of the other things going on uh, with UGA recruiting. So we're going to kind of do some of that on the show today. We're also going to get into a little bit of kind of a minor controversy that popped up yesterday involving a uh, Georgia player, which sort of speaks to the current media age, which maybe we live in. We'll address that here for a few minutes. We'll look ahead to what could be a big day today for Georgia recruiting. There's kind of a weird blast from the past out there that really kind of predates even me, my time knowing about Georgia and following Georgia, but it's kind of an interesting thing to sort of look back on and revisit. We'll do that before we wrap up. And We're going to kind of operate at a slightly different pace today there as well. I've got some stuff kind of after the show, kind of away from the show that I've got to take care of. So today we're going to move a little quicker maybe than normal. And listen, I will obviously uh, certainly have plenty of long shows, I'm sure, in the weeks to come. This one may not quite be as long. We may not quite uh, kind of sink our teeth into some of the stuff the way we often do. But we're going to have a good time nonetheless. So we are really happy to have you with us for it. It is. Oh, by the way, uh, before we're done today, too, I can't believe I didn't mention this. Special guest, Kaylee Manziel, going to join us live on the show to reflect on her time of uh, producing Dog Nation Daily here a little bit as of late and some of the stuff we might be seeing from her around Dog Nation in the weeks and months to come. So that's going to be a lot of fun before we wrap up there today there as well. That's going to be a blast. We'll do that with you then. Uh, Good to have you with us. It is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. It's presented by Kroger, and it begins right now. Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Kroger, fresh for everyone. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. All right, we're going to have kind of a wild show today. We have all kinds of different things going on. Celebrating a big recruiting win for Georgia. Looking ahead to the possibility of another one of those coming less than 24 hours later. There was sort of a weird controversy yesterday involving a Georgia player. And I use air quotes around controversy because none of this is probably all that serious. But it does speak to the sort of current media age in which we live. So we'll get to that here coming up in just a little bit. Also, special guest on the program before we conclude here today. Uh, a chance to catch up with Kaylee Manzel, who's been a big part of what we've been doing here behind the scenes for a good bit. You're going to be seeing more of her in the weeks and months to come. So we'll give her a chance to uh, kind of shout out here after. Are we already to the end of your tenure? Because you've been, is, it the, is this the end of your tenure producing Dog Nation? So Kaylee's been here for the last two weeks producing our show, done a great job. So we'll kind of celebrate that live on air. I don't have a gift or anything for it, but we'll certainly say thanks to her live on air. And we'll do that here in uh, just a little bit. Prior to that, though, let me begin with what is probably the most important piece of news around Dog Nation. A massive, massive recruiting win yesterday, last night, late, probably as late as we've done a uh, Kroger commitment special here around Dog Nation before. Joseph Jonah Ajanye, the number 37 overall player in the country, defensive line prospect out of Texas. This guy ranks in the top 10 players in the state of Texas, which is a very, very significant thing when you talk about adding a guy like that to this class. I believe 24-7 composite has him as number six overall defensive lineman. So you're talking about, you know, this is as elite a prospect can be without officially being a five-star. You know, this is one of those massive, massive recruiting wins. You know, he's a four-star in name, but when you think about, you know, top 32 players in the country typically or so, you know, they become five stars. That Ajanye is like knocking on the door of being a five-star prospect. This is a very big deal. Made his pledge to uh, Georgia there last night and a program that's been really hot in recruiting as of late. Two big offensive line additions going back to uh, uh, Michael Ewini last Friday, then Daniel Calhoun a little earlier this week, and now flipping to the other line of scrimmage, the defensive line, to bring in Joseph Jonah Ajanye. This is a Georgia team really on a bit of a heater here right now. And it's so Georgia, isn't it? I mean, it just sort of speaks to what has made Georgia Georgia these last two national championship seasons and the years before that under Kirby Smart when George was building the foundation for what would become 
national championship success. The idea that it seems like the Kirby Smart's kind of planted his flag. The coaches that work with Kirby Smart, they have kind of planted their flag around the idea that no one's going to be better on the lines of scrimmage than we are. No one's going to be better at the physical part of the game than we are. And some of that's how you coach your players up. Some of that's how you develop your players. But there is an aspect of this that is just about sort of cold, hard talent acquisition. Can you get down in the wrestling match of recruiting, and can you emerge with some big-time trophies? Well, guess what? Last few days, Georgia has been doing that in a very big way. We have reason to believe they're going to be doing even more of that, possibly in the very near future, including before this day is done, which we'll have more on in just a moment. But specifically, in the case of Jonah Ajanye, you know, why is it that he chose Georgia? What is it about Georgia that he liked? I love a quote that he gave to Jeff Sintel. And this is one of those things where, you know, obviously – in a lot of ways, and I think that Jeff Sintel does a good job of helping us with some of this. You know, for a lot of us, recruits sort of exist as a, you know, name on a list, and we have numbers next to those names of, well, this guy's rated this way and he's rated that way. And the reason for that recruiting ranking is because he's this tall and he's this big and he runs this fast. And there are all these sort of metrics and measurements that kind of become the facts and figures that really kind of dominate the recruiting discussion. We understand why that is. But then once these guys actually make their pledge, they join up at Georgia, all of a sudden then I think there's a little bit of an effort on the part of Georgia fans to sort of get acquainted with who these guys are as people. You know, what well, what makes them you know unique and interesting and what's going to make it fun to maybe root for these guys coming up in the years to come? That's what a lot of the the moments around the commitment decision that's what sort of what they end up feeling like and for with that in mind I thought that uh, Joseph Ajanye gave a great quote here uh, 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 Jonah Ajanye should say Joseph Jonah Ajanye gave a great quote here as to why it was he chose Georgia uh, this is what he told Jeff Sintel you can read the full story there at dognation.com he says it's the bond that I have with the players the coaches and the recruits and then the developmental factor that Georgia has in putting a lot of great defensive linemen into the league. Then just the people in Athens overall, listen to this. He says, I love their fans. They are really cool people. And last night we were on video with Jeff Sintel on our Kroger Commitment Special on the Dog Nation video channels. And Jeff went into more detail about what uh, uh, Jonah Johnny meant by the fact that he loves the interaction with the fans. He likes that, that you know, idea of sort of being a public figure and the attention that comes your way for that that right now at this stage of his life while that's still new and fresh that he actually really enjoys all that there may come a time in the future where maybe he has to pull back a little bit and get focused more on kind of what he's doing but for now he seems to really enjoy uh, the fact that you come to a place like Georgia, there is going to be an outpouring of support. There are going to be hundreds of thousands of fans that show their love and, and support to you. And it sounds like he really enjoys that and likes the vibe that exists in Athens. And, you know, the other thing that kind of jumps out to you here is a lot of what Joseph Jonah Ajanye says right there in terms of why it is that he chose Georgia. Boy, doesn't that sound like an exact mirror of what we heard from Daniel Calhoun a little earlier this week? That, you know, when Calhoun made that commitment pledge, you know, he talked about, hey, you know, there's a bond here. There's a there, there's a sense of unity here at Georgia. And this is a place that develops me. That's what Daniel Calhoun, the number 15 player in Georgia, said about choosing Georgia a little earlier this week. And lo and behold, now you got the number 10 player in Texas, uh, uh, Jonah Janye here saying, once again, they develop you. They put defensive linemen in the first round. And, boy, I just feel very, very closely connected to the Georgia coaches, to the Georgia players. And I'll say again, after this commitment, what I said the other day, after the Calhoun commitment, which is if Kirby Smart could write a script for his players for why it is they would choose Georgia, this is the kind of script that he would write. These are the kinds of things that he would want to be the reason why someone chooses Georgia. And I'm not anti-NIL. I don't believe you probably are either. At least most people are. They, in some form or fashion, they've sort of made peace with this. They're okay with that. But what Kirby Smart does not want is somebody saying, oh, I chose Georgia because they offered me way more money than anybody else did. Or uh, I came to Georgia because Georgia's going to let me, you know, be a superstar and get all the attention and uh, the focal point. They're going to build my brand. And you know, there's nothing against, you know, you know, brand building and, and being a celebrity and you know reaping some benefits from that I'm not against that necessarily but that's not the reason why you want someone to to choose your, your school that's not what you want even if it's a uh, a latent benefit a byproduct of that that's not the reason why you want someone to choose your school you want someone to choose the school for why Daniel Calhoun said of hey they're going to build me up as a player and I feel connected to the coaches and players I'm going to be sharing this time with on this campus and a Joseph Jonah Johnye saying very much the same thing 
that even in the category of elite prospects, not everyone's cut from the same cloth and not everybody wants the same things. There are some people who realize that deferring some sort of instant gratification now can actually benefit me over the course of the long haul. And if I'm willing to come here and work hard, on the other side of that hard work is a larger level of benefit that, frankly, I do think everyone should try to maximize their financial potential. But setting yourself up for long-term rewards is probably a better way of maximizing that than just sort of sinking your teeth into whatever sort of short-term thing might be out there. And, oh, yeah, by the way, if you're going to work hard and if you're going to defer gratification, if you're going to look towards the future – then the kind of commitment that requires means you better have a good relationship with the people who are making the same decision. And that's what it seems like George is selling right now. Joseph Jonah Ajanye kind of responding that way and uh, Daniel Calhoun kind of responding that way earlier this week. But then there's this, that when you think about the fact that, wow, George is really knocking them down right now, two big-time offensive line prospects, uh, Jonah Ajanye here, kind of a very big-time uh, guy along the defensive line there as well you start to really feel like some recruiting momentum is building for Georgia and that this could, in some respects, be a signal of more things to come for a couple of different reasons. This is where I wanted you to kind of center in on um, some of what uh, Jeff Sintel said last night, that that there could be an aspect of the, of the Jonah Ajanye commitment here that's a little bit of a harbinger for other big commitments that could also be on the way there as well. Let me let you hear Jeff Sintel from our Dog Nation commitment special last night as an example of that. Take a listen to this. The momentum here has to be said. He's now the fourth highest rated commitment in the class. And Brandon, I know you, I mean, you know where I'm going with this. I'm probably speaking your language. Williams Winery is the number two overall yeah. prospect in the country. He also has a Nigerian um, family tree. Nigerian bloodline. And, you know, I, I do a lot of these stories. I talk to a lot of these young men, uh, share their stories and really try to try to humanize them. But we started talking earlier today about his dream and his dream would be to see him, uh, Mr. Ogboko and then Williams Winery on the same defensive line at Georgia. So I think that is fascinating that Jeff Sintel is saying, when you look ahead to a, one of the very top prospects in the entire country, Williams Winery, that he and uh, Jonah Janye here share a little bit of a cultural he- heritage similarity. And from a Joseph uh, Jonah Janye standpoint, to be able to have, you know, uh, another player kind of with sort of a Nigerian descent, a, a Nigerian connection to his family, possibly a part of this class of 2024, that's something that really, I think, inspires Jonah Janye and obviously gets Georgia fans excited because of the nature of these players, the caliber of these particular players that we're talking about here. And we also know in the case of Williams Winery, who we're led to believe was probably watching this decision pretty close last night, we know that's also a player that five-star quarterback and UGA commit Dylan Riola has also talked to a little bit there as well. So we've been talking lately about, hey, what's happening along the offensive line and what's going on there? And we'd kind of had the preview in our mind there were going to be a series of big time offensive line commits to to possibly fall into place for Georgia well all of a sudden now you're thinking a lot about the Georgia defensive line situation and how uh, Joseph Jonah Ajanye potentially impacts other decisions including one of the very biggest and best prospects overall in this class of 2024 with Williams Winery and uh, Jeff Sintel saying right there on our Dog Nation commitment special last night this definitely could be one of those seismic impacts here that makes Georgia's chances of winning with Winery uh, you know, all that much greater. And obviously, Winery probably has known that uh, Jonah Janya was coming to Georgia, but that becoming official now makes it sort of aware for everybody that, you know, uh, a couple of guys that may feel a little bit of a special bond and connection with each other, uh, that could be, you know, continued, uh, you know, continue to bear good fruit for Georgia here in this recruiting process there as well. And then it's not just that, because while there's a little bit of a shared cultural heritage between Winery and uh, Jonah Janya, uh, there is also kind of a shared uh, story between uh, Jonah Ajanye and another big-time prospect for the class of 2024 with five-star linebacker Justin Williams. As a lot of you are aware, uh, Williams and Jonah Ajanye are a part of the same Oak Ridge program there in it's Conroe, Texas. That's the name of the town. Conroe, Texas. And Jeff Sintel also telling us last night that by making this official, by getting the recruiting win for Joseph Jonah Ajanye, uh, it also probably kind of signals the fact that Georgia might be in a pretty good spot right now with Justin Williams there as well. When you're talking about one of the very best players in the country there too, 24-7 sports composite ranks him as the number 13 player overall. These are the kinds of waters that Georgia is once again swimming in on the defensive side of the ball right now. So to kind of recap all of this, it's fascinating. 
Georgia won a major recruiting battle last night. Oklahoma were led to believe was the silver medalist here. They'd really made a strong push to Joseph Jonah Ajanye, but ultimately the push from Georgia was better. The track record of success for defensive linemen, Trayvon Walker, number one overall pick. That's a position similar to what uh, – Track Joe, record of success uh, for defensive linemen. Yeah, uh, Trayvon Walker, number one overall pick. That's a position hold on, I think similar we're, I think we're to what uh, – Track Joseph, record of success uh, for defensive uh, we're, we're getting a little bit of a uh, reverberation Walker, here, an echo pick. here. Position, Let's see if we can – similar I think we're, to what uh, – Joe, that's a down. lot. Of, there we go. Uh, now we're back. Uh, sorry about that. That's a track record. What I was saying is, you probably now heard me say it a couple of times. There is a track record of success there when you can think about Trayvon Walker and becoming the no more, no more number one overall pick. That's a pathway that Joseph uh, uh, Jonah Janye feels like he has a chance to follow. And other players may also be looking to follow him at Georgia there as well. Could it be Williams Winery? You know, could it be Justin Williams? The very near future for Georgia fans could be a lot of fun to watch here on the recruiting front. My name's Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Presented today by Kroger, we are happy to have you with us. No matter how you join us today, live on video. We start 945, first and 15, dognation.com, Dog Nation app. We are 10 a.m. after that on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, on Twitch, across all video platforms. We're on the radio at noon on Athens Sports Radio 960 The Ref, and we are available as a podcast wherever you find them, including the worldfamousdognation.com. We love to make the show available, podcast, video, everything else, and we are so thankful to all of you for being a part of what we do here today. Also, a big thanks to our friends at Kroger for making it all possible for you there as well. And Kroger, a great place to turn here this uh, summertime of year. You're getting ready to have a great, uh, hopefully, weekend coming up. you got folks for the, for the cookout. you got people coming over. You want food to put on the grill. You want beverages to put in the cooler. You want all of that going on here this time of year. Well, Kroger is the place where you not only get the best selection, but you also get great savings there as well. Uh, and the side dishes, the plates, the napkins, everything to make that sort of summer grilling season and the fun of this time of year, everything to make that special is right there at Kroger. I know many of you were getting stocked up for the 4th of July this past week. You look ahead to the rest of summer and all the fun stuff you got going on. Our friends at Kroger got you covered for all of that. So make sure you check them out today. All right, I want to give you a little bit of housekeeping stuff here just for a minute to give you an idea of the fact that this show is slightly different than some of the ones that we've uh, oftentimes done for a couple of different reasons. First of all, I do have some stuff kind of away from work uh, that I need to do today, away from the show at least anyway, that I need to do today. So we're going to move at a slightly different pace here. I want to leave some room at the end uh, for some live comments on video and things like that. So we're going to kind of bounce a little faster than we oftentimes do. Some of you are probably like, oh, we should go a little faster anyway. Well, today we're going to do that. So you'll at least get your wish there on that uh, for today. And something else about today's show that's going to be a little bit different. We just heard from Jeff Sintel. Uh, obviously, um, uh, Jeff and I had a chance to have a great conversation last night on the heels of the Joseph Jonah Ajanye uh, commitment announcement. Jeff on video with us there, but Jeff is also out of town, so he's not going to join us on today's show live. I'm going to react to uh, a couple of the other recruiting stories that are out there. We'll do this here in just a little bit, and then I'll put a link to the – for those of you listening to podcasts or if you go to dognation.com for this – I'll put a link to the full conversation with Jeff Sintel. So if you want to hear me talking to Jeff, as I oftentimes do on a Friday, we'll give you a link to that from what we did last night. We essentially did it on a late Thursday night. Uh, and so we'll do that as a part of uh, all of this. But Jeff not going to join us on today's show live, but he will be back with us again next week. And so that's kind of the story there on that. Hopefully all of that sort of makes sense. All right, so before we get into the other recruiting stuff that's out there and actually some other interesting kind of news uh, here for this particular week uh before we get into any of that let's also go around the doghouse here today poured today by our friends at the finish long drink and there was sort of a weird it's not really a controversy but i can't really think of another word to use besides controversy i want to use air quotes here around controversy there was sort of a weird controversy that popped up yesterday involving a georgia player on a podcast that he does statement that kind of got a lot of attention and sort of immediately sort of issued a little bit of a pushback uh because of what in this case, the George player, Tate Ratledge, thought was being taken out of context. He does 
uh, a show with some other Georgia players for a long time. He did it with our buddy Rylan Goaty. Rylan's obviously now at Mississippi State. So the other day, I think we had uh, Zion Lowe in with Tate Ratledge, and I believe in the most recent show with Cedric Von Prahn, uh, Granger, who was on there with Tate Ratledge. So maybe they're going to have a, rota- uh, a rotating cast here doing that show. I guess Tate is always a part of this particular show. And I guess the overall context here, they're talking about like stadium environments in the SEC and what's good and what's not and you know, kind of how they just – just sort of football players who are also football fans just sort of chatting about football much the same way we would do on a show like this many of you would do uh with your friends there as well just kind of talking about football and just sort of sharing opinions nothing too serious nothing to be taken you know too much from it but a quote that Tate gave during the show kind of got pulled out kind of got blown up and it sort of turned into a little bit of a thing so let me let you hear the sort of tightly edited clip here that probably uh, was not quite what Tate Rattledge wanted it to be, not the full context that he wanted. And then we'll kind of give you Rattledge's response to all this and just sort of take this wherever it goes. Let me let you hear Tate Rattledge first of all. Hey, hey, I love that. I don't know what, I, it, Neyland I don't know Stadium, what it was. No offense to Sanford or Georgia fans, but Neyland Stadium is the best stadium in the SEC. I disagree with that. 112,000? I the, Forget the numbers. And it's a bowl? Yeah, so but like, I'm going to be honest. on the river? Sanford, Sanford, when we played at Tennessee, was definitely louder than when we played at imagine Tennessee. If, imagine if our fans were in that stadium, though, how loud it would have gotten. So that's the quote from Tate Rattledge. It kind of got pulled out, kind of got blown up. And, y'all, we just sort of live in the day and age in which – that just happens, right? Take it as someone who's done shows like this for quite some time. You know, people have a tendency to just want to sort of fixate on one small thing. You may talk for an hour, but they're going to kind of sort of zero in on just a couple of sentences, especially if you're a football player like Tate Rattledge. It's the kind of thing that's going to carry some weight. It's going to reverberate. You're just going to have some of that. You see this in sports all the time, whether it be the NBA guys who always seem to have some sort of thing they send on a podcast, become some sort of soap opera issue around the league. That's just the way it sort of goes here right now for good, for bad, or whatever else. That's just kind of the media landscape that sort of exists a little bit. Well, Tate Rattledge was intending to make it very clear here that the clip that you just heard, the one that kind of got widely shared, and it wasn't just sort of like fly-by-night folks sharing this. It was also some of the larger you know, media entities that were also kind of passing this around too. Uh, and so Ratledge wanted to kind of put a stop to that. Uh, I'll show you the tweet here from Ratledge, and this got shared with me by our friend George on tap on Twitter, uh, who wanted to kind of make it clear that uh, that 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 Tate did not feel like his perspective was, was fully explained. He says the part that you just heard about the fans was not directed at our atmosphere or our fans. It was strictly about the design of the stadium. In other words, what he's saying is, is that Neyland Stadium, he says, is more conducive to noise than what Sanford Stadium would probably be. Now, listen, I'm not an architect, uh, and nor am I some sort of like, I, I guess, like acoustics ex- expert. But there is an element of what he's probably saying there that is true, having been to Neyland Stadium a few times. It does sort of seem like it's sort of built straight up and down in kind of that full bowl fashion that seems to sort of trap that noise in there. I guess there's probably a logistic sense in which that's true. Sanford Stadium, by comparison, is open on the other end because it's so pretty on that, you know, kind of in looking out on the uh, sort of the west side of the stadium across the rolling hills of Athens. Uh, the stadium also kind of leans back a little bit, I guess, in terms of the seating structure. So from an acoustic standpoint, from an architectural standpoint, point what Tate Ratledge is saying is probably true but it's also one of those things that the whole deal is just sort of an off-the-cuff statement I'm not quite so sure it's meant to be taken all that seriously Uh, you know clearly the context in which it was shared is incorrect we sort of this came up on our show yesterday uh kind of late morning yesterday when we were doing our R.S. Andrews cool down that's where we take comments and speak to people and have people kind of react to it and somebody had asked me hey did I hear what Ratledge had said or whatever else and then some other Georgia fans had jumped in pretty quick to say hold on now the clip that's being passed around and being shared of Ratledge is not all is not quite what it's in, was intended to be the Tate was actually meaning something else and a small snippet of what he said got turned into you know frankly by some nefarious Tennessee fans who were up to no good but um it kind of got turned into something different than it otherwise was this kind of became a thing there yesterday and so before like ultimately I'm in favor of just college football conversation right you know this time of year we're waiting for the season to start. We're sort of waiting for some of the uh, official stuff to begin, practices, SEC media days, things like that. So, listen, we just all buy the time by having conversations. I don't know that any of this should be taken all that seriously for the good or for the bad or whatever. But to the Tennessee fans 
who would use something like this as proof. Oh, see, even one of your own players says this. Even one of your own players says he likes Neyland Stadium. Listen, here's the thing that we know. We know that Tate Ratledge grew up as a Tennessee fan. Now, in this particular case, I think that Ratledge was completely taken out of context. I think that uh, what he says as a rebuke to some of the ways in which this has been spawned, uh, I think that should stand as the, uh, as the full record on all of this. But for the Tennessee fans who are like, the statement that Ratledge makes here is something good for Tennessee, I think the exact opposite is actually true. This is the kind of example of when you can't win a recruiting battle for a guy that grew up thinking Needland Stadium was a pretty cool place to be, when you can't re- win those recruiting battles, which in the previous years they, they weren't able to do, that sort of tells you everything you need to know about why Tennessee has been so irrelevant for so long. Because, honestly, when Tate Rattledge was a kid and when he would have said, you know what, I think Neyland Stadium is kind of a cool place to be. Way back then, you know, decade plus ago, a lot of people would have been like, of course it is. Absolutely it is. But when you say that there in 2023, now there are going to be a lot fewer people that probably realize – uh, that might be true or agree with that or anything else because Tennessee, Neyland Stadium has just been off the map as a relevant college football venue for quite some time. And yeah, last year they had the big crowd to see them beat Alabama. But the reaction to that win for Tennessee against Alabama, the intense reaction there just sort of shows you how long it had been since Tennessee had won a uh, game of that magnitude. So Tennessee fans who want to spend this as, Wow, Tate Rattledge said something good about Neyland Stadium. That proves how good Tennessee is. The fact that a guy like Tate, who growing up, I mean, we all saw the video. Was it Fox 5 at the TV station that had the original footage of this that got turned into the GIF or, uh, of, uh, I guess it was Rattledge's dad, peeling off the power T off the back of his truck when Tate Rattledge committed to Georgia? It's one of the great sort of like small images that has sort of existed in the recruiting uh, uh, you know, wars these last few years. Uh, so when you can't win a recruiting battle, uh, and years ago you couldn't, when you can't win a recruiting battle for a guy that had a power T sticker on the back of his truck for a, a young man like Tate, who uh, I'm, I'm guessing probably did grow up thinking Neyland Stadium was a pretty cool place to be. And there was an environment there that was conducive to noise or, you know, whatever else that he said. Frankly, nothing that he says is all that damning and nothing that he says ought to be taken all that seriously. This is just a guy who thought that Neyland Stadium was kind of a cool place and uh, was conducive to good environments and noise. And when Tate Rattledge was, a you know, a small child, I'm guessing that's probably the case. But when Tate Rattledge was a teenager getting ready to make his college decision, Tennessee wasn't on the map at all. And uh, a guy like that ends up at Georgia. So you got Josh Heupel at this stage of his life. He's trying to build the Tennessee program up. He's trying to resurrect something that's been, you know, lying dormant and essentially dead for a couple of decades here. And I think you're seeing right now just how difficult that is. Yeah, you can spend big on NIL. You're bringing a quarterback. Uh, but the kinds of lines of scrimmage wins that Georgia been collecting and recruiting these last couple of years, that's the kind of thing it's sort of hard to do on sort of a fly-by-night short-term basis. So Tennessee fans don't get too excited about this. Ratledge saying something nice about your stadium doesn't prove how good you are. It sort of proves how inept you used to be that a guy like this, you weren't able to win a recruiting battle to earn his services. So uh, I'm sorry that Tate Ratledge got caught up in the media cycle here, and I, I hate it for him that the media sometimes does what it does. But for the Tennessee fans who are claiming this is a W, this just sort of shows you how hard up for W's and wins you actually are. And that is Around the Doghouse. And it's poured today by our friends at the Finnish Long Drink. Now, let me tell you something. Way outside the state of Georgia, there are a lot of folks that don't have much to be happy about. But here inside the state of Georgia, we have got great stuff right now. But in at least one case, the great thing we have is only available for a limited time. You've been hearing me now for a couple of weeks talk to you about the peach-flavored version of the Finnish Long Drink. Y'all, this is the thing to enjoy right now and so many of you have been telling me about yeah ba i found it i loved it it's great i'm enjoying it and i have enjoyed hearing all of you tell me about all of that this is the time to get there and enjoy it so if you go to the longdrink.com you can uh, kind of put in your zip code and find out where near you the finished long drink is served and enjoyed and right now for a limited time here throughout the summer uh, you're going to be able to get some of that peach flavored finished long drink we've had lots of uh, sort of first person testimonies eyewitness accounts of just how fun and enjoyable all of this is so go online longdrink.com you can find out where you can pick some up or if you're more of 
the person that likes, hey, I've already got my finished long drink flavor. I already like the cranberry. I like the traditional and the blue can with the grapefruit flavor and the gin kick. You want the long drink zero, the long drink strong. Whatever your sort of flavor of choice is, it's all available for you right now. No better time, I think, this sort of warm weather time when you're at the pool, when you're going fishing, when you're playing golf, when you're doing all of those things. The finished long drink, always a great thing to have in the cooler with you wherever you go this summer. So find it online, thelongdrink.com, and get ready to enjoy some today. All right, this is normally the time in the show we get ready to welcome in today's guest, and we'll kind of do all of that. As I told you before, Jeff Sintel, our typical Friday guest, he's out of town. He's enjoying some time with his family. Uh, we're going to let him do that. We did go live with Jeff on video last night, so if you want to hear me with Jeff Sintel, we'll make sure that link is ready and available for you to hear us doing the kind of recruiting conversation we'd normally be doing on this show. You can hear us doing that there, uh, right there. So in place of Jeff today, uh, I, I am going to give you a couple of pieces of recruiting news here in a moment that I do think are worth your attention. We'll look ahead at what might happen for Georgia tonight. We'll look uh, back on another big piece of recruiting news. We'll get all that for you coming up in just a couple of minutes. Also, before we're done today, we're going to have a conversation with Kaylee Manzel, who's been doing a great job hanging out with us here at Dog Nation Daily the last couple of weeks. She's also got some big things coming up in the very near future around Dog Nation. She's going to tell us about some of that. That's going to be really fun, really exciting, at least the parts that we can talk about. I'm sure there's plenty of other fun and surprises that will be in store for later on. Some sad news in college football also kind of reminds us something about Georgia's past, which is probably worth revisiting for a minute or two here. We'll do all of that here before we are done today on Dog Nation Daily presented by Kroger. But before that, as we promised, how about some recruiting stuff here just for a uh, moment? And a piece of news that probably should not get lost in the shuffle. It's not a commitment. Georgia's had three of those, what, this week uh, with potentially more to come. But a piece of news that's not a commitment but is definitely worth making sure that you see is this tweet from Ellis Robinson last night. This is a five-star cornerback commit for Georgia. Uh, this is a guy that ESPN, and listen, we don't care about the ESPN ratings. Frankly, we're not even sure ESPN should have ratings. Uh, and if, if they do have ratings, we're not quite so sure they should be taken seriously and included in some of these composite rankings that we sometimes talk about. But ESPN did recently make a very interesting move with its overall 2024 class rankings. Dylan Riola is no longer ESPN's number one rated recruit. Ellis Robinson now is. So Georgia still has the number one recruit on the ESPN ranking, but it's not Riola anymore. It is Ellis Robinson. So you're talking about a five-star among five stars when it comes to the cornerback position which he plays. And Robinson gave Georgia fans some really good news last night. He says, I, this is on Twitter, I want to thank all the schools that continue to recruit me, but after talking with my family, I have decided to not take any more official visits. Time to lock in and get ready for the season. That is largely being considered a end of the recruiting process for Ellis Robinson. He has made a statement that is going to be uh, assumed to be the conclusion of his process, that so-and-so is coming after me and Alabama may want me and whatever else, but I am not taking any more visits. My recruiting process is done. I am locked in and ready to go with the Georgia Bulldogs. And that, folks, should be taken as very good news because if you follow the recruiting stuff here closely, go back to Jeff Sintel when he was out in uh, California a couple of weeks ago when the Elite 11 uh, finals were taking place there. They had the big seven-on-seven -seven event taking place there. And in other arenas like this, Ellis Robinson has had himself a very good summer, battling head-to-head -head with some of the very best wide receivers, such as Jeremiah Smith and others. And Robinson seems to be, to my eyes, and I'm not a scout, but uh, some of this kind of stuff is apparent to the naked eye, Robinson seems to be more than holding his own here right now. Uh, this is, I believe, once again, to quote Jeff Sintel, and you see this from the video last night, this is as good a defensive back prospect, possibly, as Georgia has brought in thus far during the Kirby Smart era and this is a recruiting battle that appears that Georgia you know, has certainly been winning and is now poised to win with Robinson coming to a close there last night. In other words, you can't get much better recruiting news as of late than what Georgia has been getting. All the official commits that have kind of come forth to make themselves public and then Robinson doing what he's doing there, that ends up being a very, very big deal. And I guess the thing that reminds me of is this. You know, in the aftermath of the 2021 season, when Georgia won that first national championship, and when the hallmark of that championship team was a defense, that I think that even those of us who, listen, every now and then I'm hyperbolic and, you know, I'm sort of carnival barker, hype man type thing. 
but I do try to sort of keep it within the boundaries of reasonableness. Um, but even if you want to try to be reasonable and logical or whatever else, when you looked at the 2021 defense f- for Georgia, there was a case to be made that maybe this is the greatest defense of all time. You know, not just the best of the modern era, the best whatever. Like, there's a chance this is just the best defense that college football has seen. And the point that I made about that at the time was – is that I do believe that defense's ultimate legacy, though, while they may be better than anything that has come before them, there's at least a case to be made that they could be, better than anything that has come before them, the ultimate legacy of the 2021 defense, I thought, would be that Georgia eventually might be able to build a defense that's even better because guys see how much fun it is to play defense at the University of Georgia. And haven't we seen evidence that that possibly could could be true when you think about what Georgia has continued to do from a recruiting standpoint on the defense side of the ball, an incoming five-star freshman like Damon Wilson for this year, the incredible crop of inside linebacker recruits that Georgia has brought in for this year. You go back and look at the cycle prior to that, what Georgia did at the cornerback spot. You know, we talked about Joseph Jonah Ajanye uh, off the top of this program. You know, you know what he means for the future of the Georgia defensive line. And a guy like Robinson who – could be an anchor of a future Georgia defense there as well. That being as good as the 2021 defense for Georgia in the future, that is not an easy thing to do given the historic nature of the Georgia defense was. Being even better, you know, maybe only a fool would make a claim such as that. But when you look at the kind of talent that Georgia continues to bring in, the level of player uh, that seems very intent uh, to be a part of this uh, Georgia defense here in the future, I think you're led to believe that the sky is the limit for what Georgia can do on that side of the ball. And what happened in 2021 was not just an appreciation of a historic season, but kind of a blueprint template for what future defenses could also look like there as well. And Ellis Robinson reaffirming his commitment to Georgia last night uh, is the kind of news that Georgia fans should not miss. And then, you know, I guess one more recruiting story that I want to make sure you're aware of is is that we're kind of manning battle stations again this evening for what could be a, another very significant recruiting win here for Georgia. Now, I'll go ahead and confess that Dog Nation may be live tonight if this happens, but I will not be able to here on a Friday evening. I was away from work last Friday night when uh, Michael Uini made his commitment announcement, and I will be once again forced to be away from work here a little bit this evening if Nyer Daniels uh, makes his commitment pledge in favor of Georgia. You're talking about one of the guys who's like, you know, inside the top 200 at least in terms of the 24 7 sports composite of you know kind of offensive line prospect and I want to go back you know Jeff last Friday when he was on the show he was sort of telling us then uh hey you know go ahead you know, actually I guess it's been last Wednesday that Jeff was on the show it's been more than a week ago now but he was sort of telling us then that and you start looking into those next few days you could see Georgia in line to sort of knock down you know four kind of four straight offensive line commits you know big run of offensive line names and uh obviously when he was the first of those on friday it continued with daniel calhoun which i think a lot of folks were really happy about because that sort of represents the in-state win for georgia the kind of thing that georgia fans sort of always seem to like keeping pace in state while it also recruits nationally and the next in line on all that could be nyer daniels here this this evening i think it's 5 p.m in fact let me show you this on the screen here the announcement from nyer daniels he says july 7th is my commitment date and then we know that going to go down at 5 p.m. to 9 on 3, I guess, going to te- uh, gonna, uh, not televise it, but you know, stream it, I guess, is the uh, phrase you look for there. Choosing between Georgia and Rutgers and Texas and Florida State. Uh, Daniel's obviously from New Jersey, so it is a Georgia-Rutgers battle here, I guess some folks probably think. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how many times here on Dog Nation Daily we've uh, done a Georgia versus Rutgers type deal here, uh, but obviously Fran Brown, who came to Georgia from Rutgers, he knows that Garden State area very well Georgia's kind of planted a little bit of a flag in recruiting there in uh, New Jersey and Daniels would obviously be the latest example of that if that is indeed what goes down Georgia looking to add another big time offensive line commit which only kind of causes us to sort of repeat what we said earlier this week that a lot of folks are having to do some second guessing on their original opinion of what Stacey Serrells is as the Georgia offensive line coach. And I told John Stinchcomb this on Monday. I'm right there as much as anybody. I mean, I'd like to think that I was willing to kind of give, uh, I guess, due deference to Kirby Smart if this is a hire that he wanted to make. There obviously must be a good reason he wanted to make it. 
But there was an element of this that didn't feel quite as exciting as some of the hires that Georgia has made. A guy who had been on the Georgia staff before, a lot of Georgia fans weren't thrilled with the progress and the performance of the offensive line during that era. There were a lot of Georgia fans that weren't quite so sure what Stacey Sarles was going to bring to the table during his second stint as the Georgia offensive line coach. But the proof is in the pudding. The Georgia offensive line performance on the field a year ago, uh, stellar. We think it was the very best in the entire country. We think it's set up to be that way again here this year too. And at the end of this season, we were also forced to conclude that a lot of these guys could be on their way out of the program there as well, which creates an opportunity for the depth that's been waiting in the wings, but also the chance to replenish that depth for, you know, for more chances at competing for early playing time and being a part of the future of this Georgia offensive line. And Stacey Serrells has seemed to be well poised to kind of collect all that and take advantage of that. Uh, Uini and then Calhoun and then potentially Nair Daniels here today there as well and who knows what comes up after that obviously uh may not be the only uh, offensive lineman that Georgia adds here in the very very near future so two kind of big stories to go along with it was obviously a big night for Georgia last night Georgia added uh, the uh, four-star uh, defensive line prospect the number 37 overall recruit in Joseph Jonah Ajanye while that was happening, Ellis Robinson also put his hand in the air and said, hey, listen, I'm as strong to Georgia as I've ever been before. I'm ready to lock it in for my senior season and get to Georgia there after that. And then just as quick as the ink dries on the uh, most recent commit, Georgia fans now also looking ahead at what could be the next commit coming up sometime this evening as another four-star offensive lineman at least has the potential and the possibility to join up here in this class of 2024. We were told it would be a busy summer. We were told that June would lay the foundation for what would happen in July. Thus far, that prophecy seems to be coming true. These are very, very fast-moving times for this 2024 class, and the uh, dogs seemingly doing all the work they can to stay on top with the number one class in the entire country. Certainly very fun to be a Georgia Bulldogs fan. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Fruit. So not quite the Jeff Sintel interview we normally get on Friday, but as I said before, we'll put a link to our conversation from last night, and uh, that will be a, a good thing for you if you did not get a chance to see that. So many of you did. We had a great live audience last night kind of tuning in to watch this. Had a lot of fun there on that. But if you did not see that, we'll make sure you get a link and get a chance to be a part of all of that. Something else I'd love for you to be a part of, all the great fun things going on with our friends at Royal Caribbean right now. In fact, let's talk about some of that as we go cruise around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. I think one of the exciting things that Royal Caribbean's got going on is, you've heard us talk about Icon of the Seas before. That's the brand new Royal Caribbean cruise ship that's going to debut January of 2024. And there's so much to be excited about there with that. But I don't want the news and the excitement about Icon of the Seas to obscure from the fact that Royal Caribbean's also about to debut another brand new ship in 2024 there as well and that's utopia of the seas utopia of the seas is going to be a continuation of the oasis class of ships that's the largest class of ships at sea right now our dog nation cruise in april of 2024 going to take place on an oasis class ship allure of the seas well utopia of the seas is going to be the latest in that oasis class of ships uh these are the ships that have all of the bells and whistles all of the different things you know the entertainment uh neighborhoods and things like that the aqua theater in the back of the ship all the great specialty restaurants in fact one of the things i have learned about utopia of the seas it's going to have a mason jar your mason jar is the specialty restaurant that first debuted on board uh uh, 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 uh wonder of the seas the, the oasis class ship i had a chance to be on back in february wonder of the seas was the first ship to have a mason jar southern themed uh restaurant it's got a you know bar a lot of bourbon things like that you got the country band that plays in there and in the uh, restaurant itself you've got all the great sort of southern themed dishes fried chicken barbecue fried green tomatoes all that kind of stuff it's just kind of a cool concept to have on board a cruise ship and i was very excited to see that utopia of the seas is going to have a mason jar restaurant which i think is just kind of a cool thing so that's kind of the stuff that that these oasis class ships have wider array of specialty restaurants you know, 20 30 something different bars whatever it's just crazy all the you know the the various things they have you know offered for the folks on board and utopia of the sea is actually going to debut in july of 2024 there as well so if you want to hear about the brand new oasis class ship utopia of the seas our good friend jessica slater great travel age can help you out with that you can give her a call 770-718-9147 that's 770-718-9147 or if you want to hear about the dog nation cruise Coming up in April 2024, her website, RoyalDogs.com, has that for you there, too. RoyalDogs.com. You can find out about going out of Port Canaveral, NASA on the Bahamas, Perfect Day, Coco Cay, uh, bigger and better than ever before. 
on the Oasis class ship known as Allure of the Seas, RoyalDogs.com. That's the website you go to to find out all about that. All right, in a minute, we're going to hear from Kaylee Manzel on our show. That's going to be a lot of fun. We'll look forward to doing that uh, here in just a bit. Prior to that, let me give you a couple pieces of news. And this is a sad piece of news, but it does kind of circle back to kind of an interesting story from George's past. At some point in time, maybe we'll revisit in greater detail, but uh, Dick Sheridan passed away yesterday. He was 81, I believe. Former he, uh, Coach, I believe, at Furman there, too, but kind of mostly famous for being head coach at NC State. And this is going back to the 1980s. And in the eyes of a lot of Georgia fans, when I say Dick Sheridan, especially if you're of a certain age, slightly older than me, probably better to, to be able to remember this, Dick Sheridan almost became the Georgia football coach. So, and I'm a little young to kind of tell this story from memory, but, you know, you kind of have heard the stories over the course of the years, and you kind of go back, look at some of the news reports at the time. So when Vince Dooley retired as Georgia coach after the 1988 season, I guess the best I have in understanding this, if you're older than me and have better memory of this, maybe you can kind of fill in some of these gaps and details there a little bit. So there's obviously a search ongoing to see who Vince Dooley's replacement is going to be. And I guess the popular choice at the time would have been Irk Russell. And it's always kind of a shame you go back and read about this. I guess, you know, Irk Russell was really kind of hurt by this, that he was, you know, uh, you know, wanted, uh, you know, you'd imagine to be the Georgia coach, maybe didn't quite feel the love. And then I guess he was offered the job and, you know, for whatever reason, like he, he would have said that he was offered the job uh, and then kind of made a public stance about saying he was going to stay at Georgia Southern, didn't, you know, turned down the job. And it was later kind of, you know, said from Georgia circles, what he, he actually wasn't offered the job because the university president didn't, didn't offer him the job. And so it became this kind of weird sort of controversy at the time about Eric Russell and whether or not, you know, he was offered the job and whether or not he would have actually wanted the job. And which is such a sad thing to think about the influential figure that, that Irk had been at Georgia prior to that, prior to going and becoming Georgia Southern head coach. The great image of Irk Russell, the Georgia defensive coordinator, the blood streaming down his forehead as he's ramming his head against the players in their helmets, which I guess you probably won't want to do today. But, you know, back in the time, that just sort of seemed to make sense. This is a great, great football figure. I know there's some people out there that have kind of argued for Irk Russell being in the College Football Hall of Fame, even though, you know, there's some specifications of the Hall of Fame that doesn't quite uh, meet. I would more than echo that. I believe there's any figure worthy of being in the College Football Hall of Fame. Irk Russell would be that. Uh, and it's sort of a shame that kind of the final story, I guess, involving him and Georgia football was one of upset and frustration and controversy about whether or not Russ was actually offered the Georgia job. Uh, he says he was. Figures around Georgia say that he wasn't. But I think a lot of Georgia fans think he probably should have been. He probably should have taken it. He should have been the person to follow in Vince Dooley's footsteps. Ultimately, that didn't happen. And then it seemed like Dick Sheridan might be the guy to get that job. And ultimately, Sheridan also decided to stay at NC State there as well. And I guess some of this was related to, if you go back and read the news reports, it sort of seems like, you know, when Dooley stepped down as coach, there was some thought he might run for governor. And so he was also not only stepping down as Georgia coach, he was going to step down as Georgia athletic director as well. And then eventually, after a little bit of time of deliberation, Dooley decided not to run for governor uh, and was going to return as athletic director. But then that period when he was actually considering that, Georgia did not have an AD. And I guess, to go back and read some of this, Dick Sheridan, who had been at NC State and had some success there, didn't like the idea of taking a job at a school that did not yet have an athletic director. Now, eventually, after Sheridan made the decision he made, Dooley also reconsidered his plans to potentially run for governor, and he went on to become Georgia athletic director in a role that he stayed in for a good time to come after that. But it's just sort of weird to think about what could have been for Dick Sheridan. The fact that he almost became Georgia football coach was, I think a lot of folks thought he was going to be the coach, and then ultimately he decided not to do that, but he passed away. And certainly we send prayers out to him and – uh, his, or I should say, his family and the NC State football community on the passing of a guy who was really a pretty pivotal figure in the ACC back uh, during that time, and obviously a successful football coach there as well. So condolences to the family of Dick Sheridan on his passing. On a completely different note, I saw some interesting news yesterday that Fox Sports has hired former Alabama Heisman Trophy winning running back Mark Ingram as an analyst for the upcoming season. And boy, the contrast here is hard not to notice, right? That at a time in which ESPN is kind of downsizing, Fox Sports seems to be expanding their college football coverage. And specifically, you know, one of the stories we talked about a lot last, you know, at the beginning of this week, you know, last weekend, uh, a story that kind of dominated the fact that one of the guys kind of caught up in the ESPN layoffs that just took place is David Pollock. 
obviously a Georgia guy, but beyond that, an SEC guy. So the ESPN network that's you know, going to be deeply entrenched as the only media rights partner for the SEC moving forward, getting rid of arguably its most high-profile former SEC player as college football analyst, at the same time where Fox, who does not have any relationship with the SEC whatsoever, going out and getting a former Alabama running back, a Heisman Trophy winner, as an analyst for its network. It certainly looks like, and sometimes appearances can be deceiving, perception can be whatever, but it certainly looks like here a little bit that one network is going one direction, one network is going the other direction, at least for right now. I don't know that Mark Ingram is a game changer as an analyst. It seems like a lot of folks are pretty excited about his presence here. A lot of folks seem to be kind of excited about this. But it just sends a little bit of a message at a time when ESPN is trying to get smaller and cheaper and at a time in which ESPN has kind of also turned its back on one of its biggest SEC familiar names, Fox Sports, who does not have any tie to the SEC, seems to be going the other direction there. Hard not to notice that. I'll also mention this, too, and maybe we'll come back and do more on this at some point in time, but we've kind of done a lot of this already. Our buddy Barrett Salee over at CBSSports.com has put out his list of top coaches in the SEC. This is a series they do. Obviously, they've already done their sort of national coaching uh, list, uh, and now they're ranking all of the coaches inside the various conferences. Uh, Barrett's still got Nick Saban over uh, Kirby Smart. We've said before we don't think that's appropriate right now. Uh, not that that couldn't still change again. I mean, Nick Saban's still coaching. If Saban were to step back up and win another national championship uh, or, you know, compete for another few years, it's not like he couldn't regain the top spot. This is not a static thing. Uh, these types of rankings, these types of evaluations, they move up and down. Whoever you kind of view as the GOAT, greatest of all time, on a situation like that, your opinion should probably change very slowly, and perhaps it shouldn't change at all. Those are the kinds of things that just don't move very much. But in terms of who's the greatest at the moment, whether it be – you know, best pitcher in Major League Baseball or best coach in college football, those are the kinds of things where there's nothing wrong with that kind of changing kind of quickly. It, it could even change frequently. And so we think that on the basis of the recent accomplishments, Kirby Smart is the best coach, not just in the SEC, in college football. Nick Saban could retake that spot if he wins more. But y'all, you know, go back and look at the last four years here. Um, if you're putting Nick Saban in, in the top of the college football world, you know, right now as a coach, I think you're doing a lot of that on the basis of kind of long-term history for him and a lot less on the short-term stuff. You know, on, a sh on the basis of short-term recent accomplishments, the kind of thing that ought to matter most in a conversation like this, it's clear that Kirby Smart's been more successful recently. So, therefore, he ought to be the top spot. We've made our case on that a million times. What I do think is interesting, though, is what happens after that. Right now, and I don't think this probably should be a surprise, Brian Kelly is ranked as number three coach in the SEC here right now. We are about to find out so much about Brian Kelly. Now, many of you are aware I've picked LSU to be in the playoff here this year. I do think this is going to be a good team, and I do believe this will be a successful follow-up to a good rookie season for Kelly in the SEC a year ago. I am no fan of Brian Kelly. We have had a good time making fun of the what I think was intentionally faked Southern accent. That just wasn't a misspeak. That was an intentional attempt to make himself seem a little bit more folksy and uh, you know, down home totally false in sort of totally false pretense type way so I'm no fan of Brian Kelly I'm really not but I think it has to be acknowledged that Brian Kelly's a pretty good football coach this is a guy that got Notre Dame to the college football playoff twice Notre Dame has an easy path to the playoff because of the prestige the program is thought to have had by the committee and things like that but you also have to win games to get there. And while Brian Kelly at Notre Dame was completely incapable of playing, of beating the best teams that he played, the teams that had greater talent than him, Brian Kelly's not going to win those games for you. He couldn't overcome the talent disadvantage. But against other kinds of opponents, unranked opponents, Notre Dame had a long winning streak. Against equal competition, Brian Kelly oftentimes would find a way to win that game. That there's a pretty good track record of success to indicate that Brian Kelly's a good football coach. And now he's a good football coach working with the kind of talent that typically populates an LSU roster. Kelly came to LSU for that reason. The only thing that he does not have on his coaching resume is a national championship. He was never going to win one at Notre Dame. He knew that. That's why he essentially left Notre Dame uh, at the end of the season when they still had a chance to make the college football playoff because he ultimately knew that he could make the playoff there and he could be on national television and reap a bunch of financial rewards, but they did not have the kind of talent to win a national championship. They still don't, by the way. Uh, and Brian Kelly knew that. And so that's why he came to LSU. So all of a sudden now, 
for winning the SEC West in your first year with really a pretty good roster in place. You've got a couple of good quarterbacks. You've got some transfers on defense. You've got some, you know, homegrown, recruited talent. In the case of like a guy like Mason Smith kind of back healthy again, there's a chance that Harold Perkins could be in the conversation for the very best defensive play in the entire country, depending on how they use him, which is a different conversation for a different day. It seems like there's some weird stuff coming out of Baton Rouge on that. But the point here is, is – the kind of talent that Kelly left Notre Dame for, he has at LSU right now. And can he make a statement for himself this year about being one of the very best coaches in all of college football? That, in a lot of ways, sort of beyond Georgia, is what this season is going to be about. And what we might find out before the season is done is that not only has Kirby Smart and Georgia passed Nick Saban by, but Brian Kelly on the heels of another win against Alabama – LSU would have passed them by there as well. And we'll make that cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. And here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Kroger, as promised, I wanted to give us a chance to have a quick shout-out here with our good friend Kaylee Manziel, who has been working so hard behind the scenes. A lot of you know who Kaylee is because you've seen her on our Peachtree TV high school football broadcast on Friday nights, our drive for the GHSA state title, which, by the way, is going to be back here sooner rather than later. Uh, Corky Hill Classic coming up very soon there as well. Our friends at Score Atlanta, uh, uh, obviously big uh, parts of all of that, and Kaylee's been a part of those broadcasts for quite some time. You, you know, know her dad maybe there as well, but you've kind of been hearing us talk to her about her time here at Dog Nation there as well. So, Kaylee, I know we kind of wrap up what has been a great two weeks. Our buddy Michael Carvel, our tr- typical producer, has been on vacation, kind of an extended uh, vacation for him. And you've been kind of in his place here for the last couple of weeks. So I want to take a minute to just say thank you. Uh, I really appreciate how well you've done. I appreciate just how, you know, any mess up that's happened the last two weeks has been my fault, certainly not yours. Uh, You've been flawless. And so I just really appreciate that. And I just want to say thank you and tell you how much I've enjoyed having you as part of Dog Nation Daily over the course of these last couple of weeks. Oh, well. Thank you. It, it means a lot. It's funny because the last two weeks have felt like a year and also one hour at the <laughs> same time. Um, but, I mean, you make my job so easy. I couldn't imagine doing this for anyone else. And I also want to give a shout-out to everybody that watches the show live. Sure. I pay attention to their comments. Um, I'm sure you heard the feedback earlier in this episode, and that's because I was looking at YouTube and looking at the comments, and I forgot to hit pause um, but no you know, they keep the show interesting. I love hearing what they have to say. And I, uh, on our morning call this morning, I, I told them that stomach hurt from laughing so hard at y'all's comments last night towards sure. VA. I sure. mean, the whole time I was cracking up. So thank you for what you do. Everybody that watches the show, I appreciate y'all tuning in every single day. I mean, gosh, y'all are so loyal. <laughs> so let's get your story here a little bit. Recently graduated from college, kind of starting your professional life. How has been a, how has How has being a full-fledged adult been here thus far? Well, I think in college, all you think about once you get past that freshman and sophomore year is what life is going to be like once you get out of college and you imagine it to be a certain way. Um, I thought I had freedom in college, and and now I have freedom. I mean, I had to get renter's insurance and call Georgia Power, and I'm like, oh, so this is what it's like to be a woman of the world. But I think for so long I knew that the only thing that was holding me back was that college degree. I just wanted to be in this full time. I wanted to do it all the time, but I knew I had to have a diploma in my hand. And so now that I'm out of it and I can do this every day and go all in on the career, that's all I've ever wanted. So we're going to see you back again this fall on our Friday nights on our drive for the GHSA state title we'll see as i'm sure a part of the uh, corky kale classic there as well we've seen you here around dog nation you've been hosting our next generation series with jeff Sintel, and i'm guessing here coming up this fall and i'm sure there's plenty of this we can't quite say yet because it's not all finalized <laughs> uh but we're going to be seeing a whole lot more of you coming up this fall on camera there as well because kaylee while she is uh, a great uh performer behind the scenes and making shows like this run smoothly and flawlessly we're also going to be seeing a lot more of kaylee manzel on camera there as well isn't that right kaylee yeah, so I there's some things that I can't talk about, obviously, but some things I can talk about is kind of going along with the high school football stuff. I will be expanding our high school football nice. part of the website, really going all in on that. I'll be doing the high school football preview. I mean, I have to follow in your footsteps, so I, I hope that I can do half as good as you have done. Um, and then maybe, and just maybe, if we can have enough people in the comments talk to BJ, maybe I'll see you guys on the 2024 Dog Nation Cruise. Ooh, I like the idea of that there as well. That's something we got to make happen. Listen, I'm in favor of you taking on a more expanded role here because everything you do is just one less thing I have to do. So I am <laughs> definitely in favor of you doing all that. And Kaylee, one more time, I just want to say thank you so much for 
Uh, great, great work here over the course of the last couple of weeks. It's obviously a lot of fun to work with you, and we wanted to work with you for that very reason, and it's been awesome here thus far. So I wanted to say thank you, and I appreciate you being here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Croker today. Thanks, PA. So total confession here for a moment. It sort of struck me out of nowhere that we had a great golden shoe that I would meant to share and just totally forgot to. And I want to make sure we kind of get that out here today. Our buddy Ryan Walker, incredibly talented guy, uh, a guy you've heard us talk about before who's won golden shoes plenty of times in the past. He sent us a terrific one about a week or so ago, and things could happen, whatever, and just end up forgetting to share that. We want to make sure we get that out there right now. And we just talked to Kaylee, the newest member of our Dog Nation team. But you think about the sort of traditional, you know, Dog Nation guys who've been here for a while. Uh, Ryan Walker sort of portrays this here as sort of like the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I think this is really funny. Uh, you see Gopher 3 and 23 there. You see uh, the four horses with me, Mike Griffith, Connor Riley, Jeff Sintel sort of all riding our horse. I got the Gator Hater countdown up there. Uh, I got the two national championships. Sanford Stadium has never looked better. Uh, Ryan Walker is a terrifically talented guy, and that's an incredible thing to see. So Golden Shoe, well-deserved, if not slightly belated, going his direction there on that. And how about our Gator Hater countdown? We'll do that here for real there as well. 113 days from right now, Georgia beating up on Florida again. The four horsemen of the apocalypse will be riding in Jacksonville, even though Mike Griffith probably doesn't like that. But we'll be there nonetheless, and we'll see you all back here Monday. Dog Nation Daily, presented by Kroger. We will talk to you then. And on video, time now for our R.S. Andrews Cool Den. And Kaylee, if you don't mind, you want to hit that uh, microphone for us over there. We're getting a little bit of feedback coming off of that. Um, and I told you a little earlier that we're going to have to move at a slightly different pace here today. And I apologize for that. I wanted to save some room for some comments. I've got a couple things I've got to do away from the show today. So I'm going to beg your pardon here. We're going to do a brief round of comments. We'll come back and do way more on Monday. And we'll kind of all be back sort of completely totally to normal by then so i apologize for that not quite being the way that it always is i'm gonna start at dognation.com today we'll get a few comments there and we'll kind of bounce around uh, everything else uh randy hall says maybe espn needs to hire kaylee also yeah maybe so one of these days maybe that, that'll be the case maybe that'll be the case atl dog 17 and others also kind of shout, shout out <laughs> tt reminding that when it comes to espn right now i'm not really quite so sure they're much of a hiring situation right now unfortunately uh that may be the case but well, you know listen you never know you never know uh b mac asking about buford's first game on tv it's in charlotte could very well be uh it's not going to be televised by us but we're going to have buford on tv a few times here uh uh for sure for sure uh BMAC wondering about the future of those CBS broadcasters. Yeah, so uh, obviously the SEC is leaving CBS, but CBS is still going to televise the Big Ten moving forward. And so they've already done some promotional stuff with this where they're, they're going to use the CBS theme song that da 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 Like that's going to be their song for the Big Ten now. Like, I mean, to me, it seems like blasphemy, but that's it's their song. They own it. It's kind of like when the, uh, uh, you know, when, when the NBA stopped being on NBC, the the John Tess song that they used to play for their NBA music. I think it's called Round Ball Rock. I believe the name of the song is. You know, NBC just sort of sold that song to FS1. So have you ever watched like Seton Hall Marquette on a Saturday afternoon Big East basketball on FS1? They got the dun 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 <laughs> They got like the, the same music from like the NBA Finals when Michael Jordan played Magic Johnson. That theme song is like on, you know, Big East basketball on FS1. It seems very, very weird to have that, but that's just what the case. They just sold the song, uh, and uh, FS1 bought it. In this particular case, the CBS song is staying with CBS because CBS going to broadcast Big Ten games, and a lot of the, I guess, sort of broadcast you know paraphernalia that has been around the SEC, they're just going to keep that in place for uh, the Big Ten. It could be Gary and Brad both too, I guess. Uh, Yet to be determined, obviously, but but could be the case. Um, let's see what else. BA uh, need a Marlowe's event, our buddy uh, Randy Hall says. Hopefully we can announce something like that pretty soon. I honestly don't know when our next thing like that might be, but it's getting about time to figure that out, though, isn't it? So hopefully we can announce that uh, very, very soon. Let me go over to a Facebook for a moment. We'll say hello to folks over there. See how people are doing. And Facebook, as always, is going to go very, very slow. Uh, let us see. Here we are on Facebook. 
Uh, Ken Holcomb says, something in the water is making the dogs and the Braves both superhuman champions. I like that. I like that. Let's see what else here. <laughs> Julian Harris says, uh, the rumor has it if you mix the finished long ring with the Dr. Pepper Strawberries and Cream, which is our brand new sponsor, he says, uh, you can go travel back in time and tell Tyler Simmons to scoot back. Well, listen, I, I don't know if you could go back in time. I don't know that it's Tyler Simmons you'd want to talk to. It's probably the official in that case you'd want to talk to to say keep that uh, flag in your pocket because, as we all know, Tyler Simmons was on side. That's really good. Um, uh, Nick Roundtree, I like that. B.A. Connor, Jeff, and Mike starring in Tombstone 2. Going back to the Ryan Walker uh, image from a moment ago, which I really like. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, yeah, Ryan Walker oftentimes in Facebook is here today. Ryan's a great guy. He really is. You know, we hear Ryan a lot. Um, uh, we hear Ryan a lot on um, – uh, our Dog Nation post game show. He calls in frequently. One of our really regular commenters. He and Randy and Tiffin and all these guys are always kind of calling in there. Uh, Ryan always does a terrific job there for sure. Um, Todd David Brown says, "What about David Pollock as a coach at UGA?" I won't presume to know what David Pollock wants to do, but it would not surprise me necessarily if David did consider the coaching part of this. I, I could see that potentially being the case. I could. Um, uh, uh, Ryan Walker says he's also planning on seeing us in person this year for a Dog Nation uh, post game show, planning on coming to a game. Ryan, I certainly hope that's the case. I would love to do that. Boy, I can't wait to get back to talking to folks in person again this year, too, for that Dog Nation post game show. Uh, that's going to be a whole lot of fun. All right, a couple final comments over here on uh, uh, YouTube, and then we're going to have to wrap it up for a Friday. We'll come back. We'll do more comments on Monday, I promise. We just got to be quick today. And no, I'm not going on another cruise, as somebody said. Unfortunately, today, this is all about work. Uh, let's see. I like this. DMAR42 says Tennessee is back as the new Texas is back. Uh, maybe that is indeed the case. Um, Foster Moss says, I hate that they're going to have to hear that song, meaning the one we're talking about before, for a Northwestern game against Michigan State. Yeah, it seems like a slightly different level of play, but I guess that's the case. Uh, Jay Shipes asking about Michael Carville. Michael's just been on vacation. Uh, Michael's going to be back on uh, Monday. Uh, he's he take he took a long. Y'all think I took long vacation? Michael Carville took a two week vacation, which I'm not against. I'm just saying uh, that's he said he said himself quite a vacation here. Uh, let's see where else. Tyson says, uh, could you see a scenario where the CBS picks up an SEC game? So unfortunately, with the contract that ESPN signed with the SEC. Like ESPN bought the entire deal, right? So the SEC does not have the the freedom to go negotiate outside of that contract. So the only the only freedom they would have is is to negotiate with ESPN within kind of the boundaries of the contract they have right now. But ESPN bought the exclusivity with that contract. Uh Let's see what else. Uh, Trevor Maffetone says ESPN better buy that CBS jingle. Unfortunately, I don't know that ESPN is much of a position to buy much of anything. Um, now, I guess they did debut a brand new college football song at the national championship, but I don't believe I ever heard it. Did y'all ever hear that? Was it good? I'm not quite so sure. Um, Paul Moon asking about Justin Williams. He asked, does Georgia have a legit shot? I guess I would say in terms of having a legit shot, I guess my answer would be yes. Now, is legit shot the same thing as winning the commitment? I don't really, you know, my predictions on stuff like that's probably not worth very much, but in terms of being legitimately very much in the picture, I believe that is the case. I believe, um, Michael Dykes. Good to see you. Appreciate that. Ducati tech says ESPN should just play the Disney theme song. <laughs> that's, that's kind of funny. That's kind of funny. Um, Spencer Clark going back and looking at uh, bad memories, that 2018 sugar bowl. That was frustrating. It was frustrating. Um, and we all know the story there, and it sort of sounds like you're Nick Saban excuse making when you say, "Well, you know, Georgia wasn't really trying." But I was so mad that day because it's like this Texas team is averages grits. You know, Georgia's got you know limit. I mean, it's like you don't really quite want to do. That. And and by the way, we had people coming on the show. We had like you know, I remember our buddy Mike Johnson, the uh, former Alabama player. He was coming on the show telling Georgia fans, y'all don't worry about the Sugar Bowl, it's not a big deal. And I think, obviously, Mike turned out to be right. He was citing evidence from his own career to say that. But Georgia fans themselves, like it's almost like they didn't want to hear it. It wasn't that Georgia fans were, um, 
you know, it, Georgia fans weren't taking comfort in someone who was not a Georgia fan saying the Sugar Bowl was no big deal. Like a lot of Georgia fans that day were just, and, and the sort of couple weeks after that were just really devastated that Georgia lost that game, even though ultimately probably didn't really mean all that much. That unfortunately, that 2018 Sugar Bowl is not a great memory. I, I will certainly uh, admit that. But Georgia, to its credit, when it was in the same situation again the following year, I think they learned from that. They handled it much better. They were probably playing a better Baylor team than the Texas team that had beaten them. They beat that Baylor team. So Georgia clearly learned some lessons from that. Now, listen, nobody likes the idea of, hey, you know, we're going to figure out a way to play better in what is essentially a meaningless bowl game. But, you know, it's probably better to win games than it is to lose them. So Georgia figured out a way to do that the following year. Um, Green Soldier says, it's, it's a good point. That probably is the only game in the Kirby Smart era where you question effort, right? I mean, Georgia's not played well before especially if you want to go back and bring 2016 in the mix. But that was the game which, like, oh, I'm not really quite so sure this effort is, is exactly what it needs to be. Uh, and that happens once. <laughs> in a place like Georgia, that happens one time. And uh, I think everybody found that distasteful, you know, coaches, players alike. And they were quite content to make sure they never do it again. Um, Frederick Meredith on the Alabama recruiting strategy. I'll just say this. It's like you want to go back and look at the 2018 cycle – Alabama kind of got a little bit flat-footed uh, there in that particular cycle. Are they being flat-footed here right now, getting caught in this cycle? You know, Nick Saban out in Italy and places like that while Kirby Smart's been back home recruiting. I don't know. I think it's still too early to tell. I mean, these things have a way of changing as you get later. Obviously, that could happen. But it's definitely the kind of thing that that I think people are certainly noticing right now that Alabama is off to a little bit of a slow start. But once again, in 2018, to go back and cite that as an example, George was off to a very slow start. At one point in time, George was ranked like 70-something in recruiting. And they were taking a lot of commitments from a lot of guys who were like, who? What? Uh, it seemed pretty weird. Uh, and yet, when it was all said and done, Georgia had the number one class. So I don't know where this Alabama class is heading. I really don't. But it is certainly starting to get some attention about where they're currently ranked. I will certainly acknowledge that. And I will tell you to check out our friends R.S. Andrews online, rsandrews.com, for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs. They'll show up on time. They'll do the work that's promised, the price that's promised. You can trust them on all of that, including water heater replacing it the same day if need to, getting the air conditioning unit tuned back up to factory fresh specs, all of that with our friends at R.S. Andrews. Sorry for the brief comments today, slightly shorter show. But uh, we got to run for now. We'll see you back here Monday. Y'all have a great weekend. And stay close to Dog Nation in the event of some good news here tonight, uh, if that goes down with Nine or Daniel. So Dog Nation Daily presented by Kroger. We'll see you again on Monday, everybody.